excited. Thank you very much to Canadian Oil Sands who's trying to get our footage of Rex Murphy on CBC News tonight. So I don't know if that's going to be the first time that we'll see an oil man hug Rex Murphy on national TV, but we're hoping to make that happen. We have exactly one hour to go through three phenomenal presentations and then straight into, uh, into our lunch with Ron Paul. So everybody, everybody knows they're here for 20 minutes. This is, I think, one of my favorite sessions of the day. I've already been a self-described policy geek and, uh, and I call myself that. And these are three of my very favorite, very, very favorite policy geek friends who are going to do uh, some presentations. Mark Milkey, I first met when he was touring with his book, Tax Me, I'm Canadian, with the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Brian Lee Crowley, I've known for probably also 10 or 15 years. Brian spoke for me recently in Vancouver and coined the phrase, uh, the perishable uh, nature of opportunities, which I have since stolen from him and have been using that phrase, uh, crediting to him though, of course, for the last year now, just talking about Canada's resource development um, and that we do have perishable nature, of there is a perishable nature to opportunities. And John Mortimer, who I think if anybody's starting to feel tired right before lunch, boy, I think he's going to keep you on your toes. So I'm not going to come back and introduce each one separately, so please join me in welcoming all three speakers. We're going to start with Mark Milkey. Thank you, Leah, and thank you all for being here. Let me jump right into it, given our limited uh, time here, 20 minutes each. I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to talk about why Alberta is broke and the uh, $22 billion lost opportunity. I'm trying to do this with this right there. And I'm going to start though not by, uh, I'm going to start not by uh, showing you numbers. I'm going to start with a painting instead. Um, it's the School, of Raph sorry, the School of Raphael, the School of Athens by Raphael, the Renaissance painter. Um, it's a wonderful painting on its own, of course, and if you've ever been to the Vatican Museum, you will have seen this on your way to the Sistine Chapel. The reason I'm showing it is because there is a lesson uh, deep within the painting if we are willing to learn it, or at least there's an observation we can make from the painting. Let's go closer up. On your left is Plato, the philosopher. On your right is another philosopher, Aristotle. Uh, now, I'm going to simplify this greatly, but they're debating, uh, we imagine, uh, how best to construct a just society, they're debating the good life, uh, how to construct uh, the, the ideal republic, or at least a republic that works. Plato, for those of you that took philosophy in your undergrad years, uh, we, we surmise anyway, and look where he's pointing, he's pointing up to the sky, Plato has this notion that there is this other realm out there, the realm of forms from which we get our ideas, and we can take our ideas and we can construct society based on those ideas or even ideals from those ideas. And um, it's kind of a top-down approach. Now, in contrast, uh, you have Aristotle on the right there, who, look where his hand is, pointing down towards the ground, as if to say to Plato, Plato, I don't know if your world of forms exists, if that realm of ideas actually exists in reality somewhere else. What I do know is that the ground beneath our feet can be touched, can be uh, measured, can be analyzed. And, and down here on the ground in the real world, uh, we can analyze human behavior, we can observe how human beings behave, and we can construct a society if we're going to do it properly based on how human beings actually behave, not how we think they should behave, not how we think they, we wish they would behave. And that's the difference between the two philosophers and how they approach how we should set up our societies, live our lives, uh, and set up our governments. Now, which brings me to politics. In politics, plenty of people start with ideas but never thresh them through reality. Uh, Aristotle uh, really is the original empiricist, saying you have to thresh your ideas through reality. There's nothing wrong with ideals or imaginations, right? You're, something in your imagination. Artists and architects start with their imagination. Uh, an architect will think of a building they'd like to build, an artist will think of a painting she would like to paint, but both of them have to work with reality to make it come to fruition, right? They can't stay in the realm just of ideas. Uh, an architect will have to take into account the kind of uh, ground uh, that he would like to build a building on, uh, the forces of wind and nature, other forces of nature. An artist will have to consider the, uh, the canvas she is going to paint on, her own skills, the type of paint she's going to use. That will circumscribe uh, or help her get to an end reality uh, in this world. Uh, but in politics, that doesn't always happen, or at least people try and delay an encounter with reality for a very long time. I'm here to talk about the reality of Alberta's finances, and you may have heard about Alberta's budget issues. Uh, you may have heard that we've been running deficits now since 
what, 2008, uh, 09, uh, four years after the recession ended, we're still running red ink budgets in a province that's still pretty prosperous. Now, why is that? Well, you often hear one reason. It's the drop in resource revenues. Uh, and that's certainly true enough. Let me show you a couple of slides to illustrate where, where we've been. If you look on the left, that left-hand bar, that was the peak of resource revenues in the, in the 2005 budget year, 17 billion. Uh, I've done what economists always do. I'm not one, but I work with a lot of them. We've adjusted everything to inflation, so all the numbers I'll throw at you uh, today are all adjusted for inflation to $2,012. But that was the peak of resource revenues to the province of Alberta, just over $17 billion. It's declined ever since, as you'll see, took a hit a couple years ago especially, has recovered a little bit. And uh, this study came out before the last budget, so I haven't adjusted that last bar you'll see on the right. But you, you, get, you get the sense of the basic trend. It's down from its peak, certainly from eight years ago. Here's own source revenue, so including the screen you just saw, but all the revenues the province of Alberta gets every year, uh, just excluding federal transfers. So again, we're not at our peak. Now, um, when I heard people over the last couple of years say, you know, well, the reason we have budget problems in Alberta is because of resource revenue declines, I thought, well, of course, that's true. That's one side of the ledger. What's happening on the other side of the ledger, on the spending side? Uh, and it's important to look at that because I know, and you probably know, uh, governments often look at uh, current year revenues, especially in Alberta, especially when they get into boom situations and say, this is wonderful, this will certainly last forever. Uh, and it certainly doesn't last forever. So I wanted to analyze the spending side of the equation because so few people were doing so. You'll, you'll hear media accounts always talking about uh, the, the drop in resource revenues. You'll hear the premier talk about bitumen bubbles. They will blame almost everything on the revenue side of the equation. And then naturally, the solution to that is more revenue. Taxes, right? Higher taxes. Or a sales tax, uh, which on principle I have no objection to if it replaces the income tax. But nonetheless, that's, that's the justification, uh, the explanation, and the, just, the justification for Alberta's uh, red ink budgets for the last couple of years. But let's, let's think about the spending side. And I'm about to throw up a chart, but let me explain it first. Uh, actually, no. Let me just throw it up. This is a 30-year look at where Alberta has been on program spending. So if you look at the left-hand side of your screen, you can't see the boxes, I'll explain them. Now, the left-hand side of the screen, you get a sense, this is per capita program spending. This is apples to apples, everything's been adjusted for inflation, all that kind of stuff. It's been adjusted for population. But you see a peak back in the early 1980s in the Lougheed era, about 12,000 bucks per person spent on programs in the province of Alberta. You start to see a decrease during the Getty years. Uh, you see a sharp decline when Ralph Klein becomes Premier and Jim Dinian is the Finance Minister and they start to rein in government spending in a big way and you see that reflected in program spending. And then you see it gradually start to climb up on the right side of your screen, plateaus around 2010, uh, and has been kind of level ever since, but still much higher than say the mid-1990s and even higher than the boom years of 2005 and 2006. So understand for a moment what I'm trying to get at with the study I put out in February, what I'm trying to communicate today. I'm trying to get at where the province went on its spending since 2005, since the boom years. Did they make the same mistake governments often make and looked at those revenues and just kept spending as if those revenues would come in the door forever? The answer on program spending is yes. And the reason I'm looking at program spending is because that's where governments spend most of their money. In Alberta, about 85% of what the province spends in any given year will be on programs. And um, so when you look at this chart, um, remember this as we go to the next one. Uh, so we know, um, remember the previous ones, remember this one. We know that revenues dropped, okay. So that's one part of the ledger. We know that on the program side, their spending has been going higher. And uh, the question is, what did that result in? What is program spending? Sorry, program spending is everything except infrastructure. So healthcare, social services. Right? Every dime the province spends that isn't on infrastructure. Everything the, everything the government does beyond infrastructure. Well, the, uh, the drop in revenues plus the commitment, really, I would put it that way, to higher spending on the program side by the province of Alberta, of course, led to this. A decrease, the blue stuff is all surpluses, the red stuff in the last couple of years are all deficits. And again, the, the one on the very right-hand side would, would be actually deeper than it was. I haven't adjusted for the last budget. Uh, for many reasons, in part because we can't actually figure out what the real deficit is after the last budget. Um, uh, but that's another presentation. Uh, the government changed the very uh, sensible reforms that Jim Dinning brought in about 20 years ago in terms of the budget transparency. 
um, and they, they played some games, I think, with the budget uh, as, of, as of last month. Nonetheless, that's where we are, okay? Um, that's the general trend. Again, the last year would be even worse than illustrated here. So I'm doing the province a favor by showing only a small deficit in 2012-13. Uh, now, okay, so what? What does all this mean? That's where we are. Well, to, to learn from history, you have to, well, you have to study history if you're going to learn from it. So um, I wanted to set up an alternate scenario because, again, I'd heard the public, uh, it was part of the public and the media and the politicians blame everything on the revenue side. Uh, but of course, if you, uh, in your personal life, let, let's suppose you earn $50,000 a year. Let's suppose you get a Christmas bonus of $20,000 one year. And you decide for the next 10 years that will likely be your income. And you go out and get a, a car payment, a, a car loan based on that income. And you up your mortgage uh, based on that income. You assume you're going to get a $20,000 Christmas bonus every year. Uh, that's one way to budget, but it's not a very prudent way to budget. But that's what governments often do. That's what the province of Alberta did when it committed to higher spending through various ways, which I'll show you in a moment and explain. But um, here's the alternate scenario. I, I wanted to go back to the boom years and say, okay, what if the province had increased spending? Okay, I, I don't have to be a radical libertarian, and I'm not even a libertarian. What if, the, you know, I accept some government? So what if the province increased program spending? I cut a lot of government, by the way. Don't, don't get too nervous. There's a lot of things government shouldn't do. But, I mean, let's just accept, uh, you know, let, let's accept where we are in the present. And if we say to government, okay, you want to do all this stuff, can you at least keep it in line with population growth and inflation? So I went back to the boom years, which I define as 2005 and 06, because that's when the revenues hit their peak. If the province had simply said, going forward from this year, we're only going to spend more in line with population growth and inflation on the program side, where we spend most money, what would the budgetary balance have looked like? Or what would its spending have looked like, first of all? Here's what it would have looked like. If you look at the blue, this is program spending still going up to account for population growth, to account for inflation. That's where the province would have been at, the, at 2013, the right-hand side, top of the blue. Where the province actually ended up is top of the red. In other words, here's the question. How much more did the province of Alberta spend beyond population growth and inflation on the program side since 2005? All the red stuff you see. And what does that equal? That equals $22 billion extra. So my argument is, if you wanted to go back to the previous screen, and think about the previous screen that I put up at per capita spending. If you want to go back to 2005 and ask the question, how much extra did the province spend beyond what it would have if it simply kept uh, its spending constant with inflation and population growth? It spent an extra $22 billion. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't remember 2005 as being particularly harsh. It wasn't. Let's go back. It wasn't 2005 spending per capita. It wasn't as low as the low of the Klein uh, years after, after the, the cuts and the reforms in spending. I mean, look at the low. It was all the way down to $6,800 uh, $6, back then. Uh, we were already up to $9,500 per person by 2005. All I'm asking is why couldn't the province have, 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 have stopped spending in addition to population and inflation since then? I think it's a, I think it's a moderate request, uh, you know, uh, in retrospect, put it that way. Uh, now, so what would that have meant if the province had kept its spending in line, $22 billion in extra room, fiscal room, over the last couple of years? It also would have meant surpluses in every single year in Alberta in the last eight years. If you look at the two lines here, you'll see the bottom line, you see blue going into red. That is the actual trajectory, that's the actual budgetary balances in the province of Alberta, goes into the red and again, would have been probably worse this past year. The top blue line is my alternate scenario. If since 2005, they'd simply increased spending, increased, but kept it within the bounds of population growth and inflation, we would have been looking at surpluses every single year, even during the depths of the recession in 2008-09. Um, so that's where we would have been. That's what happens when governments don't control their program spending. Now, um, there are examples all right, so, sorry, let me, let, me, uh, let me give you some specifics, because people say, well, what could the government have done differently? You know, shut down three hospitals? No. Uh, I'll tell you what they could have done differently. They could have not signed uh, a double inflation increase for teachers in the province, and I have nothing against teachers, but they signed a five-year deal in 2007 
the gate teachers, who were already the best paid in the country, a raise that was double the rate of inflation. They, gave, uh, they, they took away several billion dollars in unfunded liabilities in the teacher's pension plan. What, what prudent business, uh, when it's negotiating with its employees, um, gives them everything on the table, as opposed to saying, well, you can have a pay increase, or you can, we can take your pension liabilities, but we're not going to do both. The province of Alberta did both. That was very costly. That was, those were just two mistakes. Uh, if I could go back and wave a magic wand, I would say, why is the province committing to spend $2 billion in carbon capture technology uh, in 2008? There are items, there are decisions that the province of Alberta could have made in the last eight years that would have led to the, the top scenario, balanced budgets for the last eight years, just by addressing the spending side, even with the existing revenue drop. And this is why it was so important for me to crunch the numbers with my colleagues and say, where could the province have been if we looked at the spending side? Because you can't control revenues. I mean, you can try. You can try and raise a tax and hope it doesn't thump the economy. Uh, but it's more difficult to do that. And for a whole bunch of reasons, I'm not in favor of raising taxes in Alberta. Um, now, has this been done in the past? Is it realistic to go back to Aristotle? What I'm suggesting, I think it's incredibly realistic. We know from Ralph Klein, who we're uh, thinking about today because of the memorial, uh, that they, in fact, attack the spending side of the equation. And we know, for the record, I don't have the time to get into it, that it didn't crater the economy. Uh, I'll mention two indicators, though. After Mr. Klein and Mr. Dinning did work, uh, you know, some tough bud budgetary, uh, not magic, but they, they, did, made, made, they made some tough budgetary choices starting in 1993, we know that the economy did what? It actually was better than any other economy in the country in the 1990s. We know the unemployment rate in Alberta continued to decline from 8.6% uh, the year that uh, Ralph Klein became premier all the way down to uh, just over 3% we left in 2006. So we know we know that what Mr. Klein and Mr. Dinning did work. Sorry, 9.5% all the way down to 3.4% when Mr. Klein left office. We know, contrary to the critics in the 1990s, that reigning in the size of government did not kill the economy. In fact, it did the opposite. It set a base for Alberta's future prosperity and created the Alberta advantage. Um, again, there's no time to get into the details of that today. Now, uh, the question today really was, oops, um, the question today was, how do we make Alberta safe for capitals? Look, relatively, I think we're pretty good uh, relative to the rest of the country, but um, I would do a couple of things if I could wave a magic wand. I do think governments across Canada, but including in Alberta, have to reform public sector spending. Um, they have to, and that includes, for example, looking at public sector pension plans, which are very lavish. We've done some work on this recently at the Fraser Institute. Uh, we know that public sector employees in Alberta are paid 14% uh, higher, uh, sorry, 10% higher, 14% in BC, 10% higher than the private sector average after you account for age, after you account for education. Once you throw all that stuff into the mix, we know that the public sector on average is paid 10% higher than equivalent uh, private sector jobs. Uh, we do know that the public sector is very lavish and generous pension plans vis-a-vis -vis the private sector. Eight in ten people in the public sector have a defined benefit plan. Less than one in ten in the private sector has that kind of deal. And guess who pays for the public sector? The private sector. So that has to change. And this is something the entire country has to do. I'll give you a hint. The Saskatchewan ADP in the 1970s, ironically, the Saskatchewan ADP reformed public sector pensions away from defined benefit plans to defined contribution plans. They had the courage to do that. No other government has since. Uh, we need to introduce competition in healthcare and education. Only in the public sector do we accept quasi-monopolies uh, in, the, in the delivery of services. No business would accept one supplier being held hostage to one supplier. We do in the public sector for some strange reason, in government delivery. Those things that, that many people think government should deliver. We can argue about that. There's a lot of things I don't think government should deliver. But if, if government's going to deliver them, at the very least, subject them to competition. Um, remember that healthcare and education is about two-thirds of the provincial budget. If you don't subject that two-thirds to competition in, in service delivery, you're not going to be able to get a, a grasp on your budget. If you don't deal with the public sector uh, and pro, in, in program spending, which forms so much of program spending, wages and benefits, you're not going to be able to reform your budget. So you have to. So those are my suggestions, making Alberta safe for, for capitalism, reform public sector compensation, and certainly introduce comp competition in service delivery in healthcare and education. Let me end, though, with one thought, uh, or one question. Why should governments be prudent? You would think this would be self-evident. 
Why should government, governments be prudent? There are many reasons, including uh, what Ralph Klein and Jim Dinning discovered in the 1990s. When you are prudent as a government, of course, you allow uh, much room for private enterprise. You allow much room for, for prosperity. Um, and you, you allow families uh, to make a living, right? Um, that's why people have flocked here over the past decade, over the past two decades, in a way they haven't flocked to other provinces. The in-migration has been spectacular, and it's not an accident, and it's not just because we have oil and gas, right? Lots of jurisdictions, as many of you know, have resource wealth. Venezuela, Russia, um, Argentina, they don't do well. Not because they don't have resource, resource wealth, they do, but because they don't have the proper policies. Uh, to, uh, to take it out of the ground and make sure the, the benefits uh, end up in, in the wider society. It often ends up in, in the pockets of politicians. Uh, there are sensible reasons to be prudent, but let me give you one moral reason, if I can put it that way, to be prudent. And I'm going to uh, read something from a late 19th century politician, and maybe you can guess who he is or not. But I'll tell you who he is after I read the quote. All taxation is a loss per se. It is the sacred duty of the government to take only from the people what is necessary to the proper discharge of the public service. And that taxation in any other mode is simply in one shape or another legalized robbery. And this individual was speaking of the duty of government obviously to us. Now who was that? Was it a, was it a Republican from the United States who used to run for president? No. <laughs> was it someone from the Fraser Institute who might be tagged by you know, our rhetorical opponents is right wing or whatever you want to call us. No, no, it wasn't. It was Sir Richard Cartwright, the first liberal finance minister in the Dominion of Canada in his budget speech in 1878. So let me read it again. All taxation is a loss, per se. It is the sacred duty of the government to take only from the people what is necessary to the proper discharge of the public service. And that taxation in any other mode, i.e. extra tax, you know, they shouldn't be levying, he's saying, is simply in one shape or another legalized robbery." Unquote. In summary then, in an ending, why has Alberta flourished? Alberta has flourished because of past great policy choices, because in essence it followed the advice of Sir Richard Cartwright, at least in the Klein years. We should keep it that way. Thank you.